It is the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cad herder, and I'll be your guide to the next hour of conversation about the future of education. All that is a way to just welcome our program. In order to do that, I need to give you the pointer to what anchors it. Uh, we're taking a look today at XR, we're looking at the combination of augmented and virtual reality, mixed reality, extended or expanded reality. And we're doing it with the help of a great report. This is the State of XR and Immersive Learning Report uh, published by the Immersive Learning Foundation or the Immersive Learning Network. Uh, they're a terrific group and this is an important report. We've seen bits of it. And now you get a sneak peek at the full thing as it's about to appear. Now, in order to have people talk about this, in order to give us the expert uh, advice and the expert knowledge, we have three people here. You know, Jonathan Richter from iLearn. I'm just going to bring Jonathan up on stage right now. Uh, Jonathan's coming to us from uh, Montana, I believe, and he's there. Hello, Jonathan. Hey, everyone. How are How you? Are you? I'm good. Doing good, Brian. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, first, I've got two quick introductory questions for you. First of all, what's your title at iLearn? Uh, I am the president and chief executive officer of iLearn. Very good. And then yeah. the second question is, and this is a tricky question given, given everything that's going on, what are you going to be working on the most for the next year? I mean, what's, what's uppermost in your mind? Mm. Well, I mean, COVID-19 is, is obviously right up there, um, you know, helping people to get access, lowering the barriers to how people can use these incredible technologies to immerse uh, and, and learn in meaningful ways, uh, I think is, up, is foremost in our mind. We've shifted and pivoted along with many other educational technology companies uh, to, be able, to be able to do just that. So I think, I think that's probably number one. Very good. And in fact, this summer, um, we did the uh, iLearn presentation, which was done in part through um, a, a VR platform, Verbella, right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, yet we continue to work with Verbella. Uh, they, they provided a gold sponsorship uh, to our Immersive Learning Research Network conference last June. And as part of that, uh, provided us with a, a year of use of that campus. And so oh, that's what we've been doing is turning that on and and uh, working with partners and collaborating. So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, now I've got you on stage. Hold tight for a second because we can bring up two more guests. This is going to be a, a full court press here on, on XR. I am just absolutely delighted to welcome back Maya Gorgieva. Uh, Maya is a friend. She is coming to us from the new school in New York City. Uh, she is one of the world's experts in extended reality and education. And uh, she has also been a guest in the program twice. Maya, so good to see you. It's great to see you, Brian. Um, hi, John. Uh, and hi, it's great to see everybody uh, tuning in today about this topic. Indeed, indeed. Maya, quick question. What is your role in the State of XR report? In the State of XR, naturally, I look into the future of learning and the greatest opportunities that exist. Um, and we look into... Um, authentic learning, immersive learning, empowering students, um, empowering faculty, you know, thinking about um, integration of XR and AI and fostering collaboration in, in virtual worlds. So it's a compelling section and I've been honored um, to work on it. Well, Maya, that, that's all fantastic. Uh, I asked uh, uh, Jonathan what he's going to be working on for the next year. I think you just told me what you're going to be working on for the next year as well. Yes, um, absolutely. I think that uh, I think it's it's a great opportunity to find in challenging times that we find all, all of us find ourselves right now. Uh, but I couldn't be more passionate about creating the future of learning with immersive um, and technologies, and really focusing on the focusing on our students and faculty. Indeed. Indeed. Well, sit tight too, because I have to bring up our third guest for today. Uh, we've just completely filled up the entire stage. Uh, I am equally delighted to welcome another friend and another great guest in the forum before, Emery Craig, coming to us from New York. Emery is the uh, CTO of Digital Bodies, and he is here. Hello, Emery. 
Hello, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Good, good, because I had audio issues when I first got started. And hi, Jonathan, I never get to see you. Actually, I see you all the time. And Maya, I see you all the time. I see the three of you all the time. So. <laughs> boring. I, mean, yeah. I know, boring. But of course, we never see each other face to face these days. It's always through a screen. But <laughs> right. if we saw each other face to face, that would be exciting and not necessarily in a good way. Um, no, I know. We <laughs> what are you going to be working on for the next year? Um, I, I think like Maya and like John, uh, similar kinds of things um, in terms of helping roll out these technologies and strategizing ways to lower the barriers. Um, obviously, we well, we had a pe pandemic we never wanted to see, but if we had to have it, it came way too soon. I think if it happened 10 years from now, we would be in a very different position because XR would be in a very different place and a lot more people would have hardware. The hardware would be a lot better. The platforms would be a lot more sophisticated. We can talk about that in a bit. So where we are right now, of course, is I think XR is kind of scrambling to catch up or trying to figure out ways to be useful in what we can only call our new normal. And our new normal means for some people, of course, that they're scrambling to even just figure out ways to do online learning and overcome basic barriers in that, particularly in inner city neighborhoods, First Nation reservations, um, and, and any number of places. Um, but in obviously with XR, there's huge challenges here. I do think down the road, though, that it will be a game changer. And like I said, for the next pandemic, God forbid, but they do seem to happen. We might as well adjust to the reality of it. Um, when the next one happens, it will be very different because we'll very much live in virtual worlds simultaneously with living in a real world. But we're not there yet. So right now, that is the challenge, is helping overcome those barriers. And I probably put away all my Google Cardboards, thinking I'd never have to use them again. And I've been kind of dusting them off and saying, yes, <laughs> as bad as it is. It's something, if you have nothing else, it is, it's better than nothing. So, you know, here we are again. So that's where we are right now and where I am. So, and, and of course, like you, Brian, I've been grounded. Uh, my, you know, my consulting work is, is all on the screen. So, Well, we can do that. Uh, we are creative people. Uh, yeah, very creative, I know. <laughs> where things are in the present and where they might be is what we'll be doing today. So friends, if you... Two, two quick things before we dive in. If you look in the bottom left of the screen, you should see kind of tan or almost orangey colored button. And if you click that, that's going to be a link to the report web page so you can learn more okay. about that. I think Dorlin Rossman asked about that, so you should be able to click that. And the second thing is, I'm going to ask a couple of quick questions, but the forum is about your questions and your comments. So we'd love to hear from you. So again, just go back to that raised hand button or a question mark button. And throw our wonderful cruise questions uh, as we go. Um, and before I can even say anything, friends, before I can say anything, Brian Cochran of the University of West Indies just already threw us a question. Man, uh, let's see. Uh, Brian asks, how close is XR to delivering on the more tactile aspects of the acquisition of competitive companies? Who wants to take a look? I think this, this question naturally belongs in the ring of MRA um, as um, he's tackled this, you know, this section of the report, but also I think he's written quite a bit on digital bodies about um, the work that is taking place right now. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things here, but in, in terms of haptic issues, we really have a ways to go. There's a lot of fascinating developments happening. Um, I, I see it. Actually, some of the most interesting projects right now are in Kickstarter. And, you know, people are researching this and figuring out ways to make experiences more immersive. And that really is an ultimate goal here. I think for all of us, our first experience of X XR has been you put on a headset and you have this visual and you have this auditory experience, but it's going to become much more than that down the road. And that, of course, is what's going to have a huge impact on education and on workforce training. But, you know, the, the hardware for that right now is just kind of getting off the ground. And um, for the most part, it's expensive. Uh, Maya has like a whole um, volumetric capture lab buried away in some basement of the new school, I know. 
<laughs> I shouldn't say that, I know, <laughs> but it's not accessible right now, right? <laughs> unfortunately, you know? but it will be again. And I know when it is, I know Parsons faculty and new school faculty will be lined up to be using it. So. <laughs> I mean, we are tackling, I think, uh, one at a time. Uh, people tackling smell, touch, um, you know, basically various, um, all the different senses. It's going to come all together. It ultimately will. What is going to come through um, in our wearables embedded um, in, in our pants um, or like watches or similar devices, or it's going to come to, you know, direct impulses to our brain. This is coming. People are working, and it will be just as real. You'll be walking to a cow, cow, cow kind of web and and you're going to feel you know as you move through it you know how when it's coming and so i'm, I'm working with, <laughs> with the team here but that that's how that's what people are working you know today and um you know i've met uh, in silicon valley even a year ago in conversations where you have people that are looking into that looking in translating water uh, looking into translating haptics so it's fascinating we're not there yet even in a very high end industry lab um, to simulate some of these experiences, uh, it takes, uh, a, you know, sort of a, a convergence of technologies and resources, but it's coming. I think I, at the same time, I feel like we should be all um, embedded on the ground in, in trying things out, um, testing the ground, you know, finding new ways to simulate that. I mean, um, I know that I've uh, had experiences on film festivals, you know, people are, you know, the lighting matches so you can smell fire you know or having rowing with a fan so you can you can experience wind so i think i think that you just froze up um so we'll get we'll see if my uh, connection can uh start on her um right it's like we lost maya i think we lost you for a second there was just a just a pause you started to say i think uh, she might be having a connection back. Uh, Maya, you want to uh, reload the tape. Um, but before we, before we do that, thank you, Maya, and thank you, Emery, for those answers. Uh, thinking about uh, how the computing and uh, tactile computing is very, very, very important. Um, and also, you know, Don and Gary working on the, on the technology itself. I'm just wondering, Jonathan, while people come up with more questions, uh, can you uh, tell us a bit about the report, how the report was generated, and what we should expect for it. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, everyone can hear me OK, I assume. Um, mm -hmm. Good. Uh, yeah, so the State of XR project uh, was born um, out, out of a bit of, uh, you know, we, we were big fans of the New Media Consortium's Horizon Report for many years. That came out year after year. Uh, and Educause um, kind of picked that up when New Media Consortium uh, ran, ran into some troubles. Um, and, and the report, there was a, a few years there where, where it wasn't coming out. And I learned, uh, which came out of the American Educational Research Association's uh, special interest group on uh, XR uh, called Aerial SIG, Applied Research in Immersive Environments for Learning SIG. Um, and we, we were really thinking like, you know, with, within this field of XR, there's so many different sort of animals in the zoo and there's so much innovation and technology that's going on in this space. I wonder if we could just do a sort of horizon style Delphi survey report just in this space um, because we were thinking it's, it's going to continue to change and, and uh, proliferate in different ways. And uh, so Mark Lee, uh, my, my uh, partner in crime, <laughs> uh, worked with the IEEE Education Society, still does. Um, and uh, <laughs> he'd heard that we were doing this and said, John, John you guys at iLearn are probably not going to be able to really pick this up and really do anything with it, even though you've really been talking about it and working within the network for a while. So actually, IEEE Icicle uh, group uh, a working group around these different things. They picked it up and started doing these things and uh, uh, working on kind of developing a, a monthly community call and scanning the environment, looking for these things. And one, two, skip a few. What happened was that uh, um, 
IEEE decided that they did not want to actually go forward uh, with the actual production of the report. And ILEARN was going, hmm, uh, we'll do it. <laughs> so <laughs> we picked it up and uh, um, started working uh, with some of the former New Media Consortium uh, 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 executives, the people who had done uh, the work around those reports, uh, created a working space and found 100 uh, experts from around the world balanced um, uh, across various different disciplinary areas and uh, making sure that we had a good representation of, of gender and uh, ethnicity and race. And uh, we went through these, these uh, using the workspace uh, that we created, uh, we asked these three questions um, kind of in succession, uh, starting in July and ending up in November, uh, kind of working working through together to span the environment and find uh, these various technologies and really thinking about or discussing uh, the value to education uh, in the various applications. So that's kind of the the on top the, the beginnings of of the of the report for I learned. Well, that's great. Thank you for that history. Uh, I love how it keys off of so much uh so many different facets of education and technology that we've been experiencing. Um, and before I can ask you to follow up on that, there are more questions of them piling in. Uh, <laughs> um, the awesome Kelvin Bentley. Let me just bring him up on stage, actually. See if he's there. Drum roll, please. Dramatic moment. Hello. Hello, Kelvin. I saw you and then you vanished. Oh, oh, I'm here. I can hear you and I've, and I've got just a, a blank screen. Is your camera on? Yeah, I'm here. Well, why don't you ask your question and we'll have to imagine your handsome face. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, thanks, everybody. Um, and uh, thanks for bringing me on, uh, Brian, real quick. So. I guess my question is, um, you know, uh, Arizona State University just recently announced that they will be um, kind of building a new um, VR platform with a company called Dreamscape Immersive. And, you know, leave it to ASU to kind of trump everyone while we're in a pandemic, right? So I'm just wondering, what will it take, you know, what what resources will it take for schools to be able to do, you know, maybe just a tenth of what schools like ASU are doing with AR and VR tech? And do you see there being also an opportunity for us to maybe share learning experiences? So, because I almost feel like there's like a, like there's a, a new renaissance coming in terms of what learning experience, uh, you know, um, learning objects are going to be over time because I feel like so many courses are defined by, again, video clips and PowerPoint slides and kind of the usual suspects in terms of content. But this, this, new, this new era of tech still is lacking, I think, in most of our online courses or blended courses. And so what will it take for us to, you know, for higher ed especially, to get to a point where we'll be able to maybe share more content or at least be able to develop um, content in a way that we can do it more at scale so that we're not just, again, hearing about ASU doing this work, but we're hearing about many universities and also community colleges that, of course, you know, lack uh, a lot of the resources to do this uh, work, uh, as well as maybe some of our uh, research universities. Indeed. Good question, Kelvin. Hang on a second. Let me just um, thank you for the oral question. And again, we imagine you um, and your handsomeness. Let me just uh, push up, let me just knock you off once so and bring Maya on stage because she's chomping into the dance with this one. Um, here we go. Here we go. And Maya, it still must be still raining horribly there in New York. Indeed, it is. Um, how's my audio? Good. All right. Good. Good. All right. Great. Now, great question. And thank you so much. I think it's a very important question. And of course, um, you know, it's great to have institutions try new things. And obviously, it's it's wonderful that ASU is going to do that. Um, and they have an interesting partner. 
uh, in that venture, Dreamscape, uh, creating a Dreamscape Learn. Um, so building up of an idea really of, um, you know, location-based VR, which is interesting. We, you know, it's not uh, unlike what some of you are doing and some of us are doing in labs, right? Because when you have a location-based VR in the lab or in the studio, you have the opportunity to control the variables. Great. Now, they're also getting content, right? They're getting, what they're getting is immersive content, um, which is well, very well developed and produced. All right. So, and I'm going to try to link as to how, you know, as I answer this question is what we, what all of us can try, because ultimately we can try things. Um, and, you know, like, uh, you know, Arizona State's great partner, Maria and I serve as the uh, innovators in residence and humanizing immersive learning project for years. So, uh, you know, we, we love that this is taking place. At the same time, we have been working really hard for the last uh, 10 years to empower all of you. So content, right. So in their case, you know, they, they you know, or in our cases, um, they're picking up a particular area, and I'm going to advise that you do that. You know, they're focusing on bio, biology. For some of you, there are different areas in the school that matter. Um, pick up the one where you're going to have champions. Um, let's just say that also ASU is building this up on a couple of other earlier projects. They had a projects with um, Lapster and Google. Uh, some of you were already in a third, uh, second year of. Some of you maybe just starting in. But I know I see faces on on this on the screen that I know you're like three years in. So you know how that works. It's good that people get some experience with VR, and it's good. Um, and as they get some more experiences in these environments, they get better. So. Um, you know, bringing in um, the experts, and then um, something that we've been, you know, something that we've been championing. Oh, right, it's going to take a combination between thinking about these worlds, imagining these worlds, and putting, but at the same time, putting students and faculty in there. You know, asking them to discover things, and in the process of, you know, not just thinking, rethinking what you do through me through other media from text to, to film, um, taking this away and, and starting to think what happens when you're actually walking into these worlds. Um, you know, what happens when you can be um, in a new world and discovering, you know, new um, artifacts, um, you know, whether this is architecture, uh, whether this is in you know, a bio or, um, you know, you are, you know, you're excavating um, something uh, you are, you know, in, you know, in the present or put as a time machine into the future. It's trying to solve a real problem. So, um, you know, right, they're taking a very, high, you know, high level, multi, you know, a large scale approach to it. Um, but all of us can take. Oh. Oops. <laughs> Darn it. Darn it. Wow, it's a dramatic pause. Uh, very dramatic pause. <laughs> It may be that these storms are, are more substantial than in towns, or there's some stress on the infrastructure. Right there. Um, the next hey. thing, can you hear me? Yeah, you're back, you're back again. All right, the next thing you. is about the pedagogy. <laughs> what are students and faculty going to do? You know, they're going to be thinking about that. You are going to, we all of us are asked to ask. These ideas, um, ideas around different fields will come from different institutions and different places. So, you know, that collaboration between um, you know, designers and storytellers and experts in different fields and students can underestimate students. Students are going to continue to drive this forward. It is the, we are about the next generation as education. Um, so now they're also looking into you know, having a model with multiple labs across campuses. Um, and you know, similarly, like um, them, many of us are network institutions. So having your VR lab or VR studio, you know, being able to be networked uh, across different campuses. And then finally, ultimately, bringing it to a headset in, in whenever our wherever our students are. And ultimately, that belongs to all of us because, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're in New York City, you're in Paris, Shanghai, Tokyo. Um, it is basically you're going to be connecting in a virtual experience. So, yes. There is this. Uh, there is a great opportunity of looking and thinking and, uh, of what is going to take place with Dreamscape Learn. At the same time, I empower you all of you find that project on your campus and drive this timeline. That's that is all we can do as creators and educators. Thank you. That's a that's a great answer. Uh, and Kelvin, we're going to need to bring you back up to ask you more questions over the next few weeks and months. 
uh, <laughs> what you raised in all seriousness uh, is a really, really crucial topic. And thank you, Maya, for the extensive answer. Yeah. Really, really. Mm -hmm. If I can just um, add here, Brian, I think that because the other part of the question is, of course, sharing resources, and that's a real challenge. And it is something that the expert panel took a serious look at. And you all know here, Brian knows full well, but, but I think just about everyone does that we don't have the best track record in higher education of, of open educational resources. It's been a real battle. And XR experiences are costly to develop. 360 video, that's fairly simple. You know, you can get a camera for $299, a good camera. You can get out there, you can do it. You can have students work on the video. I mean, it's relatively straightforward doing that. And that actually is a really easy entry point for community colleges and institutions that don't have a lot of money or find just find themselves like with just too many competing priorities right now. But, you know, what ASU has done, of course, is that they've, surmounted that challenge of bringing in an outside partner. And I think for all of us, we're going to have to look for partners or we're going to have to look for ways to collaborate. And of course, that ultimately means, you know, you spend all this money on developing this experience. Are you going to be willing to share it with other people in higher education, other institutions, or with, you know, even with non-academic institutions, with nonprofits? Right. Because that is really, really important. And actually, Actually, the nonprofit organizations right now, I think, have a better track record in doing that because museums just want a larger audience. So, you know, here and there, museums have actually done really good XR experiences and put them out into the community for others to have. But, I, you know, we need to work on that in, in higher ed and, and K-12, which is even more challenging because no one's going to have the resources there to go do it. They're going to have to get it from somewhere else. And I don't want to see it all coming from vendors. I want to see it coming from us, from students, from faculty, not just from out other companies. Well, that's, that, that's, this is great. Uh, thank you, Emery. I really appreciate that. I'm just yes, we need to do more of the show. We've got a a ton of questions, and I'm just sifting them into, into groups. Um, and they cover, they, they respond to some of the things that you both, all three of you, have been saying. Uh, here's one from uh, Tom Haynes. Uh, this is a great friend of the program. Uh, he's coming to us from Texas. Thank you for sending us the storm, Tom. He says, yeah, thanks, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> has the pandemic accelerated or distracted from the progress of XR? And is anyone using XR as a remote learning platform in 2020? I'll put that back up on the screen so you guys can see it. Right, right. I think it's done a little bit of both. I, I was going to say the same thing. It's done both, right? Cuts both ways. It's been a huge yeah. obstacle, and it's been a light, let's light a fire under this and get this going right now. So, yeah. Go ahead, Maya, if you want to add more. I mean, as I'm embedded in higher education and, and just, um, um, you know, connecting to a number of different communities across higher education, including the Czechs community, the champions for higher education, part of what I learned. You know, yep. um, people are excited about the opportunity. Uh, people see this as a moment that we should try really hard. We should try really hard to try to um, showcase the potential of this, um, you know, new um, world. Um, at the same time, there are definitely barriers. There are barriers in, you know, access to headsets and access to to platforms and access to various tools. Not every, um, you know, not every field of study is well resourced with the right set of content, the right set of applications. But there's some unique use cases that are coming up. Um, there's also this interest where we've kind of actually made the world a little, kind of like a little, I think, the continuum stretched it a little bit in looking at applications that start from things like Second Life. Um, which is basically a desktop 3D world, two environments, you know, passing through virtual environments, like some of you know, Outspace VR or similar platforms, okay. um, and then going into mixed reality like Spatial and others, um, and then moving in, into like very interesting sort of examples of unique disciplines trying to do something in, in sort of on the edge in between, whether it's, um, you know, music, whether it's architecture, um, you know, what it's science. So um, that is a, that has been good. They're not uh, one solution fits all, um, you know, trying, there are some obviously platforms that are premium and, you know, come at a premium. 
Um, but I think ultimately, we also have to really bring people along. This is not just about the technology. It is about our faculty, our students, our researchers, bringing them in. And that is taking still some time. It was, you know, but we have, you know, we have more enthusiasm now that, you know, can we go someplace new? And I think that's the opportunity. But ultimately, we are still, a lot of us, I'm sure on this call are working in how do we bring, you know, students and faculty, you know, to feel comfortably collaborating, creating and making in these worlds. Mm -hmm. We have a, thank you. That's a, that's a really impassioned dance and a very inspiring one. Um, we have a, a quick uh, information question from Mike Eisenberg at the University of Washington. Uh, and he said, um, do you include virtual worlds within the term XR? And I think the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good yeah. question. Uh, I welcome you again. Um, good to see you. Uh, along the lines of your answer, Maya, we had about bringing people along. Let me just let me try something new. Let me just flash three questions up in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and pick one of the three. <laughs> Game show. You know, it is. is. I know. Do we get a record? Same I love it. <laughs> They're all hitting the same idea in different ways. I only show them as to hear them. Uh, Jane Wild uh, from uh, Linfield uh, University asks, you know, how do we do the maximum sensation and achieve equity? Okay, so hold on, to that, hold on to that for a second, because alongside that, um, we have this question from John Henry Stites uh, at Georgetown, um, who says, uh, with stories of students hanging out in commercial parking lots, the Wi-Fi, and my shop off right now, where our students even have the literal bandwidth to enjoy AR and VR. So yep. you see how these two are paired. And then someone chimed in with this, uh, this is Brian Mulligan. So we have a whole bunch of Brian's here, which is always good. Because I appreciate the R and D in AR and VR. I feel it is too expensive and not yet good value when compared to simple video, simple systems learning on the job. You, you see, I mean, these three questions kind of three tries the same try. Yeah. And I'm yeah. wondering if uh, Jonathan, do you want to you want to take a whack at this? Um, sure. Well, you know, going back to the original question about the sort of cross impacts between XR and the pandemic, mm -hmm. I think the pandemic has really exposed and magnified a lot of the digital divide issues that have been going on for how, go back as far as you'd like. <laughs> People do not have access to all of the materials that they need in the way that they need. And there are different people in different situations where these things, um, it's just been a quiet sort of thing. And now with uh, everyone sheltering in place, these, these, uh, these disparities, these inequities are really magnified. And uh, yeah, so I mean, the XR sort of revolution was, was going to happen about this time anyways. And now with the pandemic sort of overlaid on top of it, it's creating lots of different sort of cross impacts. Um, but uh, the digital divide is a real thing. And I think I think members of the XR community are definitely aware of it and really trying to lower the, the barriers. Look, we chose Verbella as a platform for our conference um, because it's available on the Mac and it's available on the PC. You can use it with the VR headsets. Um, it, it's not a VR platform where you can walk on the surface of the sun or you can manipulate you know, a, a lot of things using the most imaginative capacities or capabilities that XR affords you, but that accessibility is very important to us. Can everybody access it? No, you can't access it from a Chrome notebook or an iPad because it requires a downloadable executable. Oh. Um, but I think jumping in there and really trying to work on all of these different issues uh, is is really important, and that's what I that's what I learn is trying to do is to help uh, in some small way to to uh, collect the evidence for what works and uh, collaborate with all of these different uh, stakeholders from various perspectives to to keep pushing that that envelope. Understood. Good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Emery, Maya, did you want to add to that? 
I just I, I would just say that the barriers here are so immense. I was reading yesterday, and I forget the exact percentage, but the number of students in K-12 in inner city neighborhoods in New York City that are not even doing remote learning but not going to school is just absolutely staggering. I mean, well, it's a huge social issue that we've just swept right under the rug right now because um, they don't have access or they, they get a laptop issued by the school system, they don't have the bandwidth to use it. Um, it's just, or they don't have a place to use it. And it's just, it, it's just a, a, it's a god awful challenge. I mean, it's really hard. And, you know, and then on top of this, hey, we're throwing XR and saying there's this whole nother level of technology. But as Jonathan says, I mean, we need to move so fast because we have more coming. I mean, within a year or two, we're going to have AR glasses. I mean, that's clear. I mean, Facebook and Apple too, and they would do it and probably other companies will too. And that's just gonna exasperate the digital divide even more. So right. we're just, you know, we're, we're in a race and we're really far behind, but all I can say is we either find a shortcut or we run faster because otherwise we're gonna be even more of a bind down the road. Mm -hmm. I think I just want to address because that that sort of context in it's difficult to enter. It's expensive. RAD is expensive. That is all true. But guess what? And that is like there are 100 people here and I expect 100 projects from you next year about this plan. <laughs> Ever the optimist you are, Mike. Innovation. <laughs> Innovation does not happen overnight. No, it doesn't. It's true. You have to go back and and talk to your institutions and talk to your faculty because we can't just wake up and walk into these places. We all need to learn. We need to learn how to learn. So um, you kind of have to start, whether it's a small lab, a small team, a set of students, but our institutions um, need to actually build up the know-how, build, build up that understanding to take students and faculty there. So, um, you know, while you may not have to have the scale project, the, you know, the scale ops project, you know, those projects will definitely deliver value to all of us. And it's great that they're taking place in, in state and research universities. At the same time, no matter what level you're working, um, you know, starting, starting with some experimentation, some exploration, um, or in your, you know, a slab on your campus is important because um, yes, um, you know, you actually have to build the capacity within your organization to engage within your team to engage with these technologies. So I'm going to say all of the all of these things that are right there, barrier, access, accessibility, um, huge important questions. We're trying to be a champion for them. Um, you should be too on your campus and in the world. And also I connect with connect with others. You know, I brought an example earlier in the summer the, in the Iowan conference, but I'm gonna go back to it. You know, educate that um, your sort of institutions and students that you know the opportunity to create something. Uh, we every like we have a, a student from Nigeria. Um, who um, you know joins us in in our informal session meetups, and now we're empowering her. And as many of you know, there is um, lots of not not you know sort of dramatic things happening in Nigeria right now. Um, and uh, just last Friday, we discussed about how she can use augmented reality, you know, to actually power and get messages out to the streets. Um, so, so you know, see, see, these opportunities don't exist just for the rich and powerful. They exist um, across right. all of yeah. us. That's yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you. I completely agree. And Maya, and I think that's one of the great things you do with that that meetup to, you know, to bring people in from elsewhere, because I, I think it's so important. Let me just add here one, one other thing, though. My big concern in terms of the ethics of this, and I spend a lot of time, these all my time these days, I think, thinking about the ethics, is that what's going to happen down the road is that there will be an option to get hardware cheaper, and it will come at a cost. We basically will be at the cost of our personal data. And that, I you know, I can see that with AR glasses coming out, and somebody saying, yeah, they're $900, but we'll give them to you for $400 if in return we get 
you know what. Um, we all are on our social media platforms. They're free. Why are they free? Because we are the product. And there is no bigger product than knowing where we look and where we move, the gaze of our eyes and our actual physical movement. So that's something we really have to think about down the road because it's going to be very tempting because, you know, the, the people producing this stuff, they're aware of these barriers too and aware of the cost. And, you know, it's kind of interesting that Facebook came in with the new Oculus Quest at $299. I thought that was good. I want to see it at $99 to me. That is the big breakthrough when we get to $99, but even $299. And, you know, Oculus, Facebook is now requiring an account to use it. So, you know, there's a movement here that we have to be very cognizant of down the road as companies move into the, especially into the AR space and start selling glasses because I think there's going to be, you know, there's going to be, we'll get them to you, but we want this in return. We have, uh, thank you. Thank you all. I, I, I'm really glad to see us uh, struggling with this question, especially in this year. Uh, we have a quick question from Michael Jones at IWI. He wants to know, uh, are college bookstores beginning to ship or rent XR headsets yet? I think preloaded course content available in the headsets like the Oculus Quest. Not likely course code to be a next step. Have you seen this? Yet? It's usually the you know it's usually the innovation center, um, versions of the of teaching and learning center, um, <laughs> sometimes, you know making center, maker spaces, and libraries. Um, these are the three common sort of um, spaces, um, oftentimes resources. Um, that uh, I see across campuses, but then every so often there are unique opportunities. There's a student club that has them. There's a department or a program that may have them. So I think there's some variations, but the four sort of, I think, main channel have been kind of that sort of center, in innovation center, um, making makerspace um, and, and libraries. Right, yeah. It, you probably see a little more of this in the K-12 environment because there you have companies like Lenovo and I've been doing some work with Lenovo where where they sell complete kits and everything from a cart and 25 headsets and there they go to a school and they come preloaded with some content and that makes it a little bit easier in that environment to use. But even there it's challenging. I remember last year being at a school and, and everybody in the room telling me, oh, we got 10 carts and 10, 10 groups of headsets and I'm thinking, Wow, 25%, 25%, and they got 10 of them. Isn't that amazing? And then they told me, no, we have 30 schools. You don't understand. We don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> so, because it was a 25,000 student school system. Right. So I go, oh, no, no, you just, that's the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> uh, we had, uh, that's where it is. You know. We had a couple of quick notes um, that came in uh, from the chat. And quick, I just not questions, but notes I wanted to quickly share. Uh, Robert Morgan uh, wanted to recommend Frame VR, a division of Rubello. It's entirely okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then alongside that, um, let me just flash this on the screen. Uh, Carly Brady at Madison Era Technical College says that they are building VR simulations on PC right now. And John Bruchot, who is here right now, is the CEO of the company they're partnering with, uh, Academicus and Arch Virtual. So hello to uh, John and to Carly. Yeah. 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 We are Carly, excuse me. Uh, we have a different question, and this is a question that takes us back in time. And I need a kind of way back machine for this. Uh, this is from a um, uh, previous guest and uh, one of the great thinkers and practitioners of education and technology, Stephen Downs, coming to you from Canada. And he asks us, what about Second Life? And oh, aren't we just doing that all over again? What's different besides expensive hardware this time? Uh, well, it's not just expensive hardware. We've learned quite a bit. And it's important that that project existed when it existed, and we're building on top of that, just as, you know, as I said, there's even some, some reincarnation of these worlds today because of access and because of the possibility of what we can do there as a meeting space. Um, but we've learned quite a lot. And the virtual worlds of today are much more sophisticated and getting more sophisticated every day. Yeah. Um, and it's a completely different thing when you're embodied, in, you know, in a space and you're moving in space. Um, mm -hmm. And for um, for many you know, people, that makes marks a big difference um, in in being actually able to spatially relate to somebody. 
Um, and, you know, I kind of beam students and others into my living room and here we go in a shared whiteboard. And then my living room now is a third space. Um, so very, I, I would say these projects continue to have an impact uh, on how we think about that. At the same time, we are in an inflection point. We, ha we have to kind of really break free uh, and move into much more like spatial computing and spatially orienting things. We do. Yet on the other hand, it's also good. And, and it's a credit to John and to, to iLearn in taking on Verbella, which is second life-ish, if you will, different, but is in some ways the same because of a recognition that there are barriers to access here and you want to bring in as many people as possible. And you don't want to, you could set up something that's more immersive, but in doing so, you also then put up obstacles that people can't get over. And, you know, the, the conference was incredibly well attended and that's because it was easily accessible on practically any kind of device. So, yep. Yeah. You know, it's just where we are now. It's very much a moving target. But, you know, this is the time to experiment with the more immersive applications because mm -hmm. a lot of the companies have said no licensing fees right now because of the pandemic. So, you know, you should jump into those while you have the chance because I don't think next year they're going to be as, uh, as, as inexpensive as they are now. So, you know, try it out while you have the time. You know, good look at the positive side of the pandemic here take advantage of what you can so Thank yeah I, I think I, I, what you're saying is totally right on Emery and and to the point of you know is this just the second life thing all over again I I think in some ways it's reminiscent yeah. of uh, of some of those things but in another ways it's 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 a orders of magnitude more complex because yeah. of the the affordances and constraints the capabilities of what you can now do with all these different XR technologies uh, with augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, haptic interfaces, et cetera. They're so far beyond what Second Life uh, could have done back in the in the 2000s um, and, and that we need to really compare and contrast those capabilities and constraints, the, the, uh, including expense and including, uh, you know, access to hardware, et cetera. Um, and being able to line those up and uh, say, this is the evidence for what's actually yeah. working to be able to help people learn uh, using these various uh, technologies and then work kind of scrumming together, uh, all of us to be able to highlight those things, uh, which is another way of, of providing access because there's a lot of people that would love to be able to understand how to do these things, but they need they need that illumination. They need that that community of practice around these different things, and mm -hmm. that again is what I learn is trying to be able to uh, help provide. Um, and yeah. with this report being one major aspect of that, the future focus, the the here's what's emerging uh, for the technologies and trends. The research, of course, takes several years <laughs> to 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 get the hardware, get the learning learning uh, situation, go in, do the research, uh, analyze the data or the evidence, and then get it published. That's usually a year and a half, two years lag. So this future focus project kind of helps us to uh, overcome that that gap. Uh, but it's the it's the community uh, with various houses of application, uh, whether it's medical education and healthcare or, uh, nature, environmental sciences, or workforce learning, uh, or K-12, those those different areas of application where there's people working um, to take those learning uh, technologies and actually do something for specific learner populations, that's where that evidence for those specific contexts is starting to emerge. And that that also is, is really important. Maya, Maya mentioned the Checks the Champions for Higher Education in XR. Those we have 140 different institutions from around the world with people that are uh, that are that are taking that on in in higher education, and and boy, it's just fantastic to have uh, to have those leaders to be able to share and work work on that. So mm -hmm. we're we're really happy about what's going on there too. So. Not only is that a great thing, Donovan, 
So this is also a great transition to what will have to be our last question today. <laughs> this is from Roxanne Rispin, who is a wonderful friend and a long-time participant in the program. And Roxanne asks, what are your thoughts about using social VR? Uh, I've been exploring using free Altspace VR uh, and uh, developing well-being and mindfulness experiences. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, we've been talking, we've already been talking a lot about um, lots of, you know, us talking, being embodied in the world, um, you know, is about social VR. And, you know, whether it's uh, working with avatars in spaces like Ribello Frame or Mozilla Hubs, or going into alt space VR um, and um, similar VR platforms, it, it ultimately uh, is about the social experience oftentimes. And there, there are, you know, there, there's a great opportunity. Learning is a social process. And so, um, you know, it, it gives us an opportunity to really be embodied and, and you know, create a, a more meaningful conversations in different types of memories. Frankly, when people are in VR, they leave the space uh, with the idea that they've just met somebody and now uh, they kind of remember them, remember where in the room they've met them, if they met by the, you know, by the bar or if they met by the window. So like, um, you know, there's spatial awareness and, uh, about and just different ways we relate to each other. Um, so um, a lot of that is happening. At the same time, there's a lot of movement in understanding, especially in the context of future of work, in particularly, you know, uh, really understanding skills-based um, tasks and, you know, be that sort of the virtual lab, you know, from, from medical, from engineering to medicine to nursing and, and other STEM fields. So, um, you know, social is there. It's going to always be there. It's an it's uh, essential part. Um, and it's uh, something that we are building on top and bringing these other important uh, parts to education um, that we do uh, in our classrooms, in our lab, on our campuses. Yeah, and and I think the the whole social VR space has really gotten a kick from the pandemic because there were some real issues over the past couple of years. Um, alt space VR almost went belly up until a, a last minute reprieve from Microsoft. VR chat was kind of a wild west that nobody went into uh, because there just was you know, absolutely no sort of regulation of the community. And that's all been toned down. And there's a lot of good things going on now in both of those platforms and some of the other ones. So it's good to see, and, and I actually spend a lot of time in them these days but um it's you know the other side of the coin here of course is that social vr requires more bandwidth if you think you require bandwidth for one experience just try doing it with 20 other people and you suddenly find out that it's you know either that or you end up stripping it down you end up you know having a more simplistic kind of environment like for bella which is good because then at least everybody can join in but the more complex you make it the more realistic you make it and the bandwidth just skyrockets and, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's where we are right now and you know as the headsets get better and um you know i hope the bandwidth gets better then this is going to become an increasing factor as maya said education is ultimately a community social experience it's not just an individual one and that's right you know, so. speaking of community experience we actually have to pause our community experience because <laughs> we are right past the end of the <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and i have to say this has been fantastic. Uh, you three have worked on a fantastic report that we need to uh, we need to work with everyone we've been talking about, um, and we've all shared so much great so much great work. I mean, uh, Jonathan, the iLearn Network, uh, Emily, uh, the Modis, and Maya, of course, you work at the New School. I just shared a, a link for that on in the chat. Uh, what's the best way to keep up with each of you, uh, Jonathan? I assume it's through the uh, iLearn uh, site. Yep, the iLearn website, um, and and you know from the various initiatives there. Subscribe uh, if you're a member. You should be getting our newsletter uh, that uh, comes out, and uh, we'd love to collaborate with you all. And I love futurists, so. Emery, best way to keep up with you is I assume with Digital Bodies and perhaps DigitalBodies.net. I try to write two or three times a week. Sometimes I am uh, have a little trouble keeping up with that. Sometimes I do more, so I do as much as I can. So, and you know, uh, and please send suggestions for articles, ideas, comments. We love to hear your feedback. So. Indeed, indeed. And, and Maya, is, is Twitter the best way to stalk you? <laughs> 
uh, Twitter, LinkedIn is a good way to, um, you know, X Reality Center at the New School. Yeah. And Parsons School of Design. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you three for being fantastic, fantastic guests. Um, it's a deep, deep subject, and you've just driven so far into it. And just in the last couple of minutes, we've gotten a slew of people pointing us to uh, a blockchain based distributed VR network, uh, talking about Microsoft, I'm oh, sorry, Mozilla Hubs, yep. Facebook Horizon, and there's more and more to this. I think we need to uh, return uh, this spring uh, and, uh, and follow up because we clearly have a lot to talk about, a lot of the changing. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, but don't go away yet, friends. Uh, I've got to show you what's happening over the next uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks. It sounds like a long time, um, but we actually have a lot to cover. And let me thank everybody for all the questions that you've raised, uh, which are just absolutely terrific. Again, your questions, your comments really drive us and really show uh, what the community can do. Um, so just to let you know that looking uh, ahead, we have a few sessions on the work-life COVID balance. We have a session on pedagogy. We have a session on accrediting agencies, which are crucial, kind of dark matter for higher ed. And we have at least one session on education and technology. Now, we have lots of ways to keep this conversation going. If you'd like us to look into Verbella for more conversations or any of these other platforms, just let me know. But we have a whole bunch of uh, social media sites for you to dig into, especially Twitter using the hashtag FTTE. If you'd like to look back into our past programs, including uh, Maya and Emery's previous sessions, as well as our conversations about all kinds of technology, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive and you can dive back in there. And uh, if you'd like, please stay in touch. FTTE.us will give us some of our reports, shindig.com for the technology. And for me, thank you all for all of your attention today, all of your thoughts, all of your questions. It's great to hear from you. Please take care, be safe during this incredibly crazy session, and we'll hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>